Pastor Javen will continue on the series called Exodus from Exile, exploring the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. This morning we'll see that obedience is what is important to God, and part of obedience is sacrifice and service. So take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's service. I want to share from Romans chapter 12 with you. It's Paul's letter to the church. And starting in verse 3, he writes them and he tells them this. He says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think that you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. And he says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, but we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you the leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if a gift, if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Father, we pray that this would be our desire, that we would desire to be a body of people that loves each other, that loves the world around us, that, Father, we hate what sin is doing to our world, that's doing to our to the loved ones around us. But, Father, we love greatly and we serve greatly. Help us to be obedient. Help us to see the way that you have called us and gifted us and how we can be used for your name, for your glory, to serve your kingdom well and to serve others, serve others well and to honor you and honor others. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time in worship, celebrating you. And we pray that this time has prepared our hearts today for what you will speak into us. Take this seed, plant it deep into the soil of our heart, and let it produce good fruit in our lives today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You know, at the end of the great 80s decade, <clears throat> that I got to spend some of my life in. Um, there was a movie that came out, and this movie produced some fantastic lines. Uh, one line from this movie is one that I like to do at wedding rehearsals, especially if I know the couple really well. It's the line that goes, My wedge. My wedge is what brings us to God today. Love to love. <laughs> love that line. There's also the one word line that I love. It's great. It's just very simple, but it works in some great situations. You just blurt it out. Inconceivable. You know, it's that wonderful line. And then most everyone knows if you saw the movie, my name is Anigo Motoyo. You kill my father, prepare to die. Right? You know that line. Of course, I'm talking about the wonderful classic, The Princess Bride. If you've never seen that movie, it's, uh, you know. I mean, what movie, what great movie could star Andre the Giant and be a classic, right? I mean, this is a phenomenal movie. There's a great line in this movie, though, that's not as heralded as the others. It comes at the beginning of the movie. If you know, if you know the movie, the movie is the grandfather is reading the story of the princess bride to a young Fred Savage who's sick in his bed. And he's, he's reading the story, and he starts by reading the story, and he's, and, and he's talking about the story of Buttercup. And in the beginning, you know, she, he's telling how she loves to demand a lot from the servant Wesley. And she's very demanding of him. She asks him all kind of stuff. 
<clears throat> but the line that's so great, it's the line that comes as he's reading at the very beginning. And the line goes like this. He says, as he's reading the story, one day she learns, because every time that, but whenever she would demand something, Wesley would always say, as you wish. That would always be his response. So he's reading the story. He says, one day she learns that when Wesley says, as you wish, what he's actually saying is, I love you. So sweet, right? So sweet. Such a, such a great line. We forget that line. Last week, in a very unique way, uh, we started this series, Exodus from Exile. And I say unique way because God had a, his own way to get this series started last week, where we were looking at the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're looking at the journey of those who were in exile because of their cap- they had been taken into captivity because of sin in their life. They were disobedient to God. They didn't listen to the voice of God. They'd been taken into captivity. And so now God is fulfilling a promise to bring them back if they repented and came back to him. They did. And God is bringing them back out of exile. So we're looking at this story of their journey from exile into captivity back to their homeland. And we're looking at what we can learn from this of leaving a life of exiled in sin and returning and going to a life that God has called us to, that God wants us to have into a place where God wants us to be. You know, the exile happened, the captivity started when Judah was taken captive by Babylon. We looked at this at the end of last year, if you were here, it was in a series we called In It, Not Of It. We looked at the book of Daniel. We looked at the journey of Daniel, of Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, those three more famously known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you missed that series, if you weren't here then when we did that, you can always catch it online, watch it or listen to it. But we talked about what it's like to live out our faith in an environment and in a world that is hostile towards our faith. And if you know, you know, we live in a day and time that's a lot like that. And so we looked at what kind of things we can learn from that. But now, if you remember, Persia took over from Babylon. And now we're in this time where there's a king by the name of Cyrus. And we briefly mentioned this last week. We, we said that at the end of Second Chronicles, we see where Cyrus's heart is stirred by God to release a wave of people to go back to their homeland of Jerusalem. And so these people are going back. We're going to see later in the book of Ezra and in the book of Nehemiah. In fact, if, it's very interesting. Old manuscripts actually have Ezra and Nehemiah as one book because the, the, the stories are, uh, they're, they're combined. They're together of what's happening. So a lot of old manuscripts have these as one book, not as two separate books. But, but we're seeing later Artaxerxes release, release a second wave of people with Ezra to go back to the nation of Israel, to the land of Jerusalem. And we see a third wave go back with Nehemiah, and that's to rebuild the wall around the city and around the place. And so we see these kings being mentioned. Now, I want you to put yourself in this story and in this situation for a second. Because the people that are going back to their homeland, these people had been in captivity for at least 70 years, some more probably at the time that they're finally released to go back into exile for at least 70 years. So many of these people, most of these people, they didn't grow up in the homeland. They didn't grow up in Jerusalem. They didn't grow up in Judah. They didn't grow up in that area. They didn't know what it was like. They've only heard stories about the homeland. They've only heard stories about what God had done for the nation of Israel. They'd only heard stories about how they were taken and freed out of uh, the, the captivity of Egypt and how they wandered in the wilderness, but eventually God led them into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. And they went into this land and for years, God protected them under kings of David and Solomon and God worked with them and God used them and, and God did many great things to them. They've only heard these stories about how beautiful that area once was. I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a second and think about this. Now we've got websites like ancestor.com and all these different things now that you can can research, and some of you probably have. You've researched where your genealogy goes back to and <clears throat> what homeland that your, your ancestors likely came from before your family ended up in America. So imagine that you discover where your ancestors are from, and you only hear stories about that homeland. You've only heard great things about that place. <clears throat> 
You've only heard this, these, these many different tales of what took place there. And you hear how beautiful it is. And all of a sudden, you get the opportunity to go back to your homeland. But you're wrestling with the fact that, well, I've built a comfortable life here. I've built something that I'm familiar with here. I built what I know here, but now I'm going to go back here. And now you hear that the place you're going back to that was once beautiful, that was once great, is actually in ruins. It's destroyed. But yet you feel this strong stir to go back. What does that look like? What, how will you... How will it look like for you to go back into that? Will you be able to do what you're doing here? Will you find a place to be able to live as comfortably as you're living now? See, when God stirs your heart, obedience is a very important thing. But obedience isn't always easy. In fact, when Nehemiah was stirred, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. We didn't get to really talk about this last week. A cupbearer, if you don't know, it was someone that basically, when food or drink was brought into the king, the cupbearer was the one that drank it or ate a little bit of it first. And the reason being was because if it was poison, they would die and not the king. Right? So this is a position that you, it's a very risky position. But at the same time, it makes you a close confidant to the king. And you're in the palace. You're in a very comfortable place other than having a very risky job, right? And so Nehemiah is in this place, but all of a sudden he hears about what's happening in his homeland and he becomes burdened because of the ruins that they are in. That, that they are in. And he feels the stir in God's heart to go and to help rebuild that area and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. But in his role as a cupbearer, Carrying this burden is hard. And to carry that burden into the presence of the king is not something that you want to do because if the king realizes that you're a heavy burden, the king probably doesn't want you in his presence because the king doesn't want to have to carry your burden. And so Nehemiah goes into the presence of, his, of the king, Artaxerxes, and he's carrying this burden and the king realizes it. And Nehemiah writes these words, Nehemiah chapter two, verse two. He says this, he says, the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. And, and Nehemiah says, then I was terrified. He was terrified because he knows that's not something you should be in the king's presence. But here's what's awesome. Nehemiah had already spent time in the throne room of the king of kings. And the king of kings loves to carry our burdens. And because he had been in the presence of the king of kings, when he entered into the presence of this king, his fear was not greater than his faith. And so he told the king what he was burdened by. And the king released him to go back, but not only released him, he released him with resources to go back and build a land that years ago, the people they took captive, took captive. And the point of that and reading that is not to think, well, if my faith is always great, then everything will always work out the way I want it to work out. That's what we talked about in that series, In It, Not Of It, with the book of Daniel. That's not the point. The point is just that we need to have a faith that's always greater than our fear. To get into the throne room of a king of kings so that we can strengthen our faith and grow in that faith. So Zerubbabel, who led that first wave of people. Ezra, who leads that second wave of people. Nehemiah, who leads that third wave of people. It's, it, the, what's important is they're obeying. And obedience is what's important. And, and that obedience isn't necessarily easy. And also, in that obedience, they are leaving something behind. Every group of people is leaving what they had for 70 or more years built in their own life in the place that they were in at that point in time. They were leaving it behind. They were leaving what they knew. They were leaving what was comfortable. Nehemiah was leaving the comfort of the palace to go to a place of ruins and destruction. But where obedience isn't always easy and obedience calls us to leave things behind sometimes, obedience is what's important. And obedience is what God has been calling people to from the very beginning. When God put Adam and Eve in the garden, obedience was a key part of that very beginning. He put them in God, the Genesis tells us he, he put them in a garden that was beautiful. He gave them everything they needed to survive. He gave them everything they needed to eat from. But there was one tree he told them, don't eat from it. 
And obeying that one simple thing was too difficult. And their disobedience became our curse. And then we journey years later and we see that God makes a covenant with a man by the name of Abraham. And he tells Abraham that he's going to birth through him a son, him and his wife who were barren. You think that's not possible with God. Anything is possible. And God says, I'm going to birth through you and through your wife, Sarah, a son. And through that son is going to birth a nation. And through that nation is going to bless the world. It's a promise that God made. And we talked about it last week. God keeps his promises. But as soon as Abraham's first son was born from Sarah, God called Abraham to an act of unreal obedience. He called him to sacrifice that son, Isaac. What in the world? Why? Why would God ask a dad to do that? It's extremely hard to understand. I'm not going to deny that. That is a story that's very difficult to read and to grasp and to think, why, God, would you ask a man that you promised, I'm going to give you the son, and then you give him the son. He spends some time with him, and he grows in his relationship, and he bonds with his son, and then all of a sudden you ask him to take that son and lay him on an altar and sacrifice him. That's tough. But Abraham obeys, and he goes through with the act, but we find out that it's not the sacrifice that God wants. It's the obedience because God provides a sacrifice in that moment. Isaac's not sacrificed. God wanted to see the obedience of Abraham where it's difficult for us to understand that story and why it takes place that way. The point of it is obedience is important to God. Solomon, the first king that God gives the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel looks around and they, 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 they see all these other nations with kings. We want a king. Give us a king. So Saul, Saul, uh, Saul is their first king. And we see that in Scripture, Saul decides that he's going to make a sacrifice to God based on what he thinks is a good sacrifice. And we see the prophet Samuel come to him and he tells him, Saul, it's not about how the sacrifice looks to you. And he tells him this very popular statement, he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. And he's saying this to him in a culture that's all about doing sacrifices. This is what this culture did. They offered countless sacrifices. But the prophet says to Saul, he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. David, who would become the king after that because of Saul's disobedience, David, who would become the king, he would write these words in Psalms chapter 40. He would write these words he would, as he begins to have a perspective change about sacrifice and what sacrifice is. He says, you take no delight in sacrifices or offerings, even though that's what you've called us to do. It's not the sacrifice and the offerings. Now that you've made me listen, he says, I fully understand. You don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. In verse 8, he says, I take joy in doing your will, God. It's just all about being obedient to you and your will, for your instructions are written on my heart. And then Solomon, who was David's son, and he would be the king after David. These were some of the most prosperous years of the nation of Israel under David and Solomon. Solomon, who would become king, he would write these words in his letter, in, in his Proverbs, in his wisdom. He says, the Lord is more pleased when we do what's right and just, when we obey, than when we offer sacrifices. In other words, he's saying, look, you can go through all your rituals of bringing your sacrifices, but it's not about the sacrifices, people. It's about your obedience and your heart of obedience. After Solomon, the nation of Israel didn't fare so well under their kings, and they were divided into two different kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom. There was a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had wicked king after wicked king after wicked king to wicked king, and eventually they fell captive to Assyria. That happened before Judah fell captive to Babylon because they kind of fared a little bit better. They would have a godly king than a wicked king, a godly king than a wicked king. It kind of, kind of had a role. But after the northern kingdom is taken captive by Assyria, the prophet Hosea comes and he makes this statement. He said, Oh, Israel and Judah, what should I do with you? Asked the Lord. For your love vanishes like the morning mist and disappears like dew in the sunlight. I want you to show love, not just offer sacrifices. 
I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. Let our prayer be that we know God completely and we understand who he is and what he's called us to. It's what we've been praying from the very beginning of this year because that's what God wants. He wants us to know him because the more we know him, the more we live obedient in our hearts to him. That's what God's called us to. It's about obedience. Sacrifice and service, it's a part of obedience, but obedience is what's important. God didn't just want the rituals of Israel. He wanted their hearts. He wanted to know them and he wanted them to know him and know who he was. Listen, sometimes in our life, we may feel the pull of God towards something. And you may feel a pull of God in a direction in your life that you're looking, and if, I, and if I'm following this pull, if I'm following this, then, then what's on the other side of that, that draw just feels, it looks like it's going to be miserable. It looks like the end of a dream that I have that I think, think is a dream on this side. You know, maybe, maybe God is stirring you and God's calling you to, to leave a job that, that you're in because he has something different for you somewhere else. I'm not prophesying that. I'm just saying maybe that's the case. Maybe God's calling you to stay in a job that you're looking for a way out of because he's got a purpose for you where you are right now. Maybe God's calling you to confront sin in someone's life that you love and you see how that sin is destroying their life. Perhaps God is calling you to not allow your honesty and your life of integrity to be compromised in a situation in your life and you feel that stir and you feel that move. And as you look at these limited perspectives in your life, and you're thinking, God, you're calling me to something different. Maybe God's stirring you and moving you to ministry away from something. You thought, I'd never go into full-time ministry, but God's calling you and stirring your heart. And as you look at it through your limited perspective, you think to obey that call is terrible. It's like Isaac being asked to sacrifice, or Abraham being asked to sacrifice his only son Isaac from Sarah. And you think that I, that's, that's tough. But if in your discernment, you know that it's God stirring your heart, the only question you have to ask is, am I going to be obedient? Am I going to trust God? And am I going to follow his lead? We see in Ezra chapter 2, Ezra chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 3, we see a list of names of people who choose to obey God and go back in these waves of people to the nation of Israel. And I want us to see something that they do, that in each one of these waves that they do as they go back, as these groups of people are going back, I want us to see what they do and some of the first things that they do. Ezra chapter 2. If you have your Bible, you can go there. It will be on the screen as well. But Ezra chapter 2. Verse 68, this is that first wave of people that's going back, predominantly being led by Zerubbabel. It says this, verse 68 says, when they arrived at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the family leaders made voluntary offerings toward the rebuilding of God's temple on its original site. And each leader gave as much as he could. The total of their gifts came to 61,000 gold coins, 6,250 pounds of silver, and a hundred robes for the priest. Then if you flip over to Ezra chapter eight, you'll see the second wave. They're going in with Ezra. If you jump to verse 24, you see one of the first things that they're doing. It says, I appointed 12 leaders. This is Ezra of the priest. Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 other priests to be in charge of transporting the silver, the gold, the gold bowls, the other items that the king, his council's officials, and all the people of Israel had presented for the temple of God. I weighed the treasure as I gave it to them and found the totals to be as followed, 24 tons of silver, 7,500 pounds of silver articles, uh, 7,500 pounds of gold, 20 gold bowls, equal to, uh, in value to 1,000 gold coins, two fine articles of polished bronze as precious as gold, uh, 
And as I said to these priests, you and these treasures have been set apart as holy to the Lord. This silver and gold is a voluntary offering to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. Guard these treasures well until you present them to the leading priests, the Levites, and the leaders of Israel, who will weigh them at the storerooms of the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. So the priests and the Levites accepted the task of transporting these treasures of silver and gold to the temple of our God in Jerusalem. And if you flip to Nehemiah chapter 2, we'll go to verse 16. This is the third group of people that's come. Nehemiah has been walking around the city. He's been looking at the walls and the shape that they're in. Nobody knew he was out there. But then all of a sudden he goes back and he talks to the leadership. Starting verse 16, the city officials did not know I had been out there, what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. And then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And they replied at once, this is their heart. This is their reply. Yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. They went to work. Obedience is what's important. God wants us to have a heart of obedience, to follow him, to obey him. And sometimes the part of that obedience is sacrifice and service. And as we look at these groups of people who are going back, every single group of people, the first, the second, the third group of people, every one of them, they went back into their homeland with the desire and the heart to give everything they could of their time, their abilities, their resources to make happen what God had put in their hearts to happen. And as we wrap up, I just want us to to see what happened in that third wave of people that went in. And you see the story in Nehemiah chapter three. If you didn't read it this week, I encourage you to read Nehemiah chapter three, just to see the people at work. But when you go into Nehemiah chapter three, here's what's interesting. You see a group of people doing work. It's, and and Nehemiah makes sure to tell us, it was priests, it was goldsmiths, they were perfumers, there was people's daughters, there were merchants, there were government officials, there were gatekeepers. What he's saying is there was all different types of people out on the walls, doing the work. It's just like what Paul talked about in that opening text that we read in Romans chapter 12. It was one body working together towards one goal with one purpose, but there were many different parts operating and doing the work. And that's what God had called them to do. You know, I think about the fact when we go on a mission trip, we've been on mission trips before and we would, being in the DR, we would be building churches or orphanages or things like that, laying brick and doing all these different things. And you got preachers, you got construction workers that knew what they were doing, electricians, you got beauticians, (laughs) you got daughters, you got sons, you got all these different people working together, doing one thing. And I remember one time we had built this wall and the foreman comes by and he makes the comment or, or somebody comes by and they made the comment, the wall is kind of crooked. And the foreman, the heavy says, it's okay. The stucco will straighten it out. <laughs> We're one body working together with one goal, with one purpose, all for God's kingdom. And as we work faithfully in our obedience, God comes behind us and he straightens out what needs to be straightened out. But we're working together and we're serving him. When you read Nehemiah chapter three, think about this. You see that they report someone who actually worked on the dung gate. Who wants to work on the dung gate? The dung gate serves the purpose for exactly what you think it serves. It serves. 
Who would want to work at the dung gate? But they talk about who works at the dung gate. And that's what makes this body metaphor so beautiful that Paul uses. Because there's things about not every aspect of the body is something that everyone hopes that becomes their part or their trade or their work or their role. But the thing is, every part of the body serves a function and is important. And it has a role. Whether it's desired or not, it has a role. Listen, there are some hands that are only going to extend themselves to you. There are some people who are only going to cry on your shoulder. There's some people that only will hear Jesus from you. We all have a part. We all serve a place. We all have a reason. But for the body to work, the body has to go to work. We see in Nehemiah chapter two, we see at the end of it, the people say, let's do this. Let's go to work. When you read through Nehemiah chapter three, you see the people working. You see them doing the work. When you get into Nehemiah chapter four, you see Nehemiah give a progress report. And in verse six, he makes this statement. He says, at last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city. Why? Because the people worked with enthusiasm. Other translations say, because the people had a mind to work. The people were determined. They had a resolve to put forth the necessary effort and actions that it took to move forward in progress. That's what Nehemiah was saying. What did Paul tell us in that letter? Romans chapter 12, verse 11. What did he say? Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord. How? Enthusiastically. With enthusiasm, not with dread. enthusiastically desiring. See, the big idea of what makes what we do in this life valuable and meaningful and purposeful, it's not what we do. It's who we do what we do for. And when we understand we're doing it for the King of Kings and for God and for his kingdom, then because of what he's done for us, we should do everything that we do with the greatest of enthusiasm. It was the people within the community that made happen what happened. It wasn't one person. Yes, Nehemiah's name is on the book. Yes, Ezra's name is on the book. But it wasn't one person that made it happen. It wasn't one group of people, a group of popular people that everybody looked to, to make it happen. It was the community as a whole working together to make it happen. Again, (laughs) we know who rebuilt the dung gate. His name was Malkijah. And even though the area that he worked in was unappealing and not desirable, it meant enough for God to inspire Nehemiah to put it in his writings. And if you feel unknown, if you feel unimportant, if you feel like what you do is undesirable and unappealing to others, you need to know that God knows you. God sees you. God hears your heart. God hears what your prayers are. God sees your acts of love. And God appreciates what you do. And as you serve God, you are never wasting your time. You are investing your time. And no matter how unknown you feel, no matter how unappreciated you feel, no matter how uh, uh, unappealing the job you may be doing looks, it is a big deal because you're a big deal to God. And what you're doing is for his kingdom, and that's a big deal. There's never anything too unimportant. Another thing we forget is that the people's names that we even do know the Nehemiah, the Ezra. They're just ordinary people. James, the brother of Jesus, talks about this in his letter when he writes, and he puts it in there, and he's talking about the great prophet Elijah, who's heralded as one of the most prominent prophets by the nation of Israel. Everyone looked up to him. He was as equal to what they would think of as a Messiah. And James writes these words in James chapter 5, verse 17. He said, Elijah was a human just like we are. He said, but when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, then none fell. What was it about Elijah? 
He just prayed earnestly. And his faith was greater than his fear. See, we're just ordinary people who serve an extraordinary God. And when you put your ordinary self in the hands of an extraordinary God, he will do extraordinary work through you. Elijah, Nehemiah, Ezra, all of these people, they're just people that made themselves available. You just have to make yourself available. But then there are those that think, no, no. Look at Nehemiah chapter three. It says, next were the people from Tekoa. Though, if you're from there, if there is a town in Georgia called Tekoa, if you're from there, I'm sorry, this, it's not about you. He said, though their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. See, I really, there's nobody, I know there's, this isn't anybody in this room, but too often there are some that think they're too important or they're too busy or they're too good or whatever to do what work God might be calling to be done. The one commentator called the Tekoites aristocrats. He said they disdained manual labor. They refused to put their shoulders to work. Another commentator just called them lazy. <laughs> Go back to Paul's words, Romans chapter 12, look at verse three. What did he say? Because of the privilege and authority God's given me, I give each of you this warning, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Measuring yourselves by the faith God's given you. And then in verse 11, again, what did he say? Never be lazy, but work hard enthusiastically. And then look at what he said, too, to the church of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. I think that is a verse that every single one of us should remember. I try to keep that in my mind. Javen, you are not that important. Because I'm not. None of us are. Because it's all about God. Listen, are there seasons in your life where you can't do certain things? Absolutely. But is there ever a time in your life where you can't do anything? No. We all have a role that we can play. See, sometimes we think that if I can find the right church, to serve me the way I need to be served, then I can become like Christ. If I can find the right church to serve my kids well, to serve my family well, then we can grow to become like Christ. No. You might find a church that can help carry your burdens, and that's great, but that's not becoming like Christ. The Gospels tell us that Jesus didn't come into the world to be served, but to serve. So to become like Christ, we serve. We have to have a heart that says, I want to serve. Now, another thing that real quick I want us to notice is that when the people were working, it says that they worked next to a house where they, or next to where they lived. Now, Nehemiah doesn't say this, but um, I think it comes just by common sense that if the people were asked to serve on a part of the wall next to where they lived, it was if the wall is primarily purpose is for protection, then that means if they're doing it right where they live, they're going to make sure it's done right. And they're going to do their best work. Because if they're working at a place that's important to them, they're going to put their best work in. So if you've ever wondered, where do I serve God? What matters most to you? Where is your heart moved the most? Because what matters most to you is where you're going to give your best in. That doesn't mean you can't serve in other ways and in other areas, but you're going to give your best in what matters most to you. The people had a heart of obedience, and they served God. John Maxwell, he made this, he, he's a former pastor, but many of you know him as a great leadership guru. He made this statement one time, you got four different types of people. you got cop-outs. These are people that just aren't going to do anything. You got holdouts. These are people that make excuses for why they can't do everything. 
And one of my favorite quotes about excuses is excuses are tools of incompetence built on monuments of nothingness, and those who use them seldom ever accomplish anything. Love that. So they are holdouts. And then you got your dropouts. These are the people that they start, but then they just stop. Well, I've given. I've done enough. I've done my part. I've done something. This has gotten too hard. This is too miserable, whatever. They drop out. Then you've got your all-outs. The all-outs is what we want to be. The ones who give everything that we can to the ability that we can to serve the kingdom of God, to make ourselves available for God to work through us. Because as we do, he will work through us. He works for us, he works in us, and he works through us. It's exactly what Jesus did. He worked for us when he went on the cross because he took our sin and the punishment of our sin for us. And when we realize that and we accept that and we become a follower of Jesus Christ and we begin to live our life in him, then he begins to work in us and he begins to transform us into who he has originally created us to be, not who sin has tainted us to be. And then as he works in us, he begins to work through us to continue to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his love and his grace and his kindness and his mercy. And that's what God wants to do through us. Nehemiah came to the people with a plan and the people just worked the plan. Jesus gave us a blueprint and a plan for his church. It was basically worship him above everything. Follow him. Know him. Love others. Be compassionate for those who are lost. Serve. Give generously. Make disciples. Churches implement that plan differently in a lot of different ways. You know, I live under the philosophy, under the KISS philosophy, not the band. Gene Simmons has nothing to do with it. It's that philosophy, keep it simple. I know everybody doesn't like that word. Keep it simple, we'll say smarty. So I basically, I mean, the idea, I mean, we want to be, we envision a church of disciple-making disciples who love and serve in a way that is contagious and magnetic. That's what we envision our church being. Because we know God has placed us here to see that that people's lives can be transformed. And not only can their life be transformed, they can become catalysts for transformation. It happens very simply the way we want to see it happen in three different areas. Large environments like this one, where we come together as a body of people worshiping God and pouring out our heart towards him, loving him, being encouraged, being equipped. And then we're in, the, we're building, we've been building, we're in the process of rebuilding some of these big environments, not large, but big environments that, that go to men, women, senior adults, young adults, youth, children. And then you've got small environments where discipleship and small groups take place. My heart and my desire for years, predominantly discipleship takes place on campus here, and that's great. We'll never stop that. But I want and long to see Bethel become a place in a church of small groups because I know how powerful a group can be for someone in their life. Discipleship, it can happen right here. You can grow. But getting around a table, getting in a living room, getting somewhere, eating over dinner, and talking about what God has been teaching you, what God has been showing you, how God has been ministering to you. What has God been teaching you? What has God been showing you? What has God been doing in you? And growing in those relationships together can be a very powerful thing. The early church, they grew through their by going to the temple and by meeting in each other's homes. So as we do those three things, then the other thing is we serve. And the way that I am encouraging us to serve is through these big environments and small environments. We have got community organizations in this community that do phenomenal things to reach the poor, the hungry, the hurting, the homeless, the orphaned, the abandoned, 
There's no reason for us to try to reinvent the wheel in that regards. We should just be the church and plug ourselves as the church into these places to show the church loves you, the church wants to serve you, and the church wants to help you. So I've been encouraging the leaders of these big environments, men's, women's, young adults, senior adults, youth, children, all these other areas to find a place in our community where you can pour in. As you develop small groups and as those begin to develop here in this house, we will encourage small groups to have a place that you serve, that you help. Not to do everything, but you can't do everything. But you can do something. God is calling us to build His kingdom. And obedience is what's important. We need a heart of obedience. Sometimes with that obedience comes sacrifice and it comes service. And we just have to say, God, how do you want me to serve you? And how do you want me to be used by you? To build your kingdom and grow your kingdom. Stand with me today. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for what we see your people doing when you delivered them out of a life of captivity because of where their sin took them. And you took them back into the homeland that you promised for them. And God, this was a group of people that set their minds to work in rebuilding and building what you had called them to be. And Father, in our life, you free us from a life of captivity and sin. A sin that's at one time tried to destroy our life and ruin our life. God, you've brought us now to a new place. We want to be a people that serve you and serve you well and build your kingdom. So God, we just pray that you make us obedient to you. And help us, Father, that in everything we do, that we love you and that we show your love that we're driven by a love for you and to honor you God not to just do things to check something off a to-do list but to to do but to do things because we're obeying you in our life out of a heart of love and admiration for who you are we lay our hearts at your feet as we close this time together today I just encourage you to worship Worship the Father. Place yourself in His presence. If you need to come up front and do that and worship in Him, do that. If that if that's an act you need to do, whatever you need to do, just spend some time in worship and adoration to Him and open your heart and say, God, where do you want to stir me and stir my heart to serve you, to sacrifice for you, to be obedient for you? If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccamden.com, go to our contact page. You'll find a link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566. And we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.